Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. It's been nearly 130 years since the mutilated corpses of five women all prostitutes, were discovered in London's Whitechapel district. Due to the brutal condition of the victims, slashed and in some cases ripped wide open with major organs removed, the police called their suspect a ripper. And with that, the world's most notorious serial killer was born. The case of Jack the Ripper has torn its way through popular culture inspiring everything from the stories of Sherlock Holmes to Hannibal Lecter. Historians and true crime writers alike have offered their theories as to the identity of the Ripper, assembling a suspect list of over 100 names. Yet the question remains, who was the man or woman behind the Jack the Ripper crimes? I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. While it is far too late to bring Jack the Ripper to justice, here are a few of the most compelling Ripper theories, from a member of the royal family to a well-respected English painter. Perhaps he or she finally can be brought to justice, in spirit, if this case is ever solved. The Royal – Prince Albert Victor Even the royal family is not above suspicion. Queen Victoria's grandson, Prince Albert, suffered from syphilis. His sexual proclivities and rumored patronage of prostitutes placed him in the vicinity of the crimes and victims. In 1970, a British physician claimed that syphilis-induced insanity could have driven Prince Albert to commit murder. Others have argued that his status as a royal aided in a massive cover-up and explains why the Ripper was never identified. The Physician, Sir William Gull The nature of the murders indicated that the perpetrator had medical knowledge, someone like a surgeon or a coroner. The motive, claimed by movies like 2001's From Hell, is that Queen Victoria wanted Prince Albert's secret marriage with a former prostitute suppressed, so she ordered the royal family's physician, Sir William Gull, to enact a murderous rampage through Whitechapel. Gull then sent a letter to police, penned in an illegible scrawl now known as the From Hell Letter, to throw authorities off his track. The Painter – Walter Sickert In one of the more intriguing theories, Patricia Cornwell in her 2002 book Portrait of a Killer – Jack the Ripper – Case Closed argues that painter Walter Sickert was Jack the Ripper. She points to possible clues in the artist's own paintings, many of which seem to mirror the Ripper's crime scenes. In one painting, a woman is stretched across a bed. 
echoing the position of final Ripper victim Mary Jane Kelly. Another depicts a well-dressed man at the foot of a bed with his head hung and hands clasped, while a naked body lies rigidly behind him, her face turned in shadow. Sickert himself made no secret of his fascination with the Ripper case, going so far as to dub one of his paintings Jack the Ripper's Bedroom. Still, skeptics counter that the similarities are mere coincidence, noting that the most ominous Sickert painting people point to is actually related to the infamous Camden murder of 1907. Undeterred, Cornwell sought to further prove her theory. She analyzed a series of letters sent to Scotland Yard that many believe had been penned by the Ripper. Cornwell compared the artifacts to Sickert's own writing paper. The two reams bore the same rare watermark, which was made by Sickert's father. If a jury had seen that, Cornwell said, they would have said, hang him. The Merchant, James Maybrick Three years before the Ripper murders occurred, a rash of eerily similar serial murders, this time of servant girls, took place in Austin, Texas. Dubbed the Servant Girl Annihilator, the murderer was never brought to justice. In her book Jack the Ripper, The American Connection, Shirley Harrison argues that the Austin killer and Jack the Ripper are one and the same. She purports to have evidence that her suspect, a cotton merchant named James Maybrick, was in Austin and London at the time of both crimes. The Surgeon Sir John Williams. Yet another deadly doctor theory posits that the Ripper was Sir John Williams, Queen Victoria's royal surgeon. Much of the case stems from the book The Fifth Victim by Antonia Alexander, a writer who claims to be the great-great-great-granddaughter of Ripper victim Mary Jane Kelly. Alexander's investigation began after she found a locket of Riley's containing what seems to be a photo of Sir John, proof that the two were close and possibly secret lovers. Sir Williams specialized in obstetric surgery, and believers of the theory assert that he butchered the women of Whitechapel to inspect their reproductive organs in hopes of curing his wife Lizzie Williams' infertility. The Woman, Lizzie Williams Then again, perhaps Jack the Ripper was actually a Jill the Ripper. Some have proposed that the real reason the Ripper case went cold is that London police were looking for a man. A retired lawyer has put forth the theory that Lizzie Williams, the wife of aforementioned Ripper suspect Sir John Williams, the surgeon, was driven to murdering prostitutes out of sheer rage and jealousy. Three of the Ripper victims had their reproductive organs torn from their bodies. As stated in the Sir Williams theory, Lizzie was infertile. So the royal, the physician, the painter, the merchant, the surgeon, the woman, we will likely never know the true identity of Jack the Ripper. On April 16, 1897, cashier Joseph A. Stickney was murdered during a daring daylight robbery of the Great Falls National Bank in Summersworth, New Hampshire. The frenzied investigation that followed crossed state and national borders, resulting in the arrest of Joseph Kelly, a resident of Summersworth with peculiar habits. Joseph E. Kelly confessed to the murder leaving the court to decide whether his actions were driven by a mental disorder, whether he was feigning mental disability, or whether Kelly had in fact made a contract with the devil. 24-year-old Joseph Kelly lived in a room in a Summersworth, New Hampshire boarding house across the street from the Great Falls National Bank. Every day, he would watch through the bank window as the elderly clerk, Joseph A. Stickney, counted piles of greenbacks, gold and silver. Kelly, who was in debt and in desperate need of money, began to imagine how easy it would be to walk into the bank and take that cash. The image became irresistible, and Kelly devised a simple plan to rob the bank. 
On April 15th, Kelly went into the bank wearing a false mustache and goatee and carrying a revolver. The presence of a woman customer in the bank scared him off, but the following day he once again donned the disguise and entered the bank when no other customers were there. Joseph Stickney, the cashier, knew Kelly, but the old man did not recognize him in the false beard. Kelly ordered some stamps from the cashier, and when Stickney went into the cashier's room, Kelly followed him and shut the glass door behind him. When Stickney shouted for the police, Kelly struck him on the head several times with a blackjack. Stickney fell to the floor, and Kelly cut his throat with a razor. Kelly quickly stuffed $4,125 in bills and coins into a pillowcase that he'd brought with him. The door to the cashier's room had locked when shut, so Kelly had to shatter the glass to get out. The bank was still empty, and Kelly was able to leave unobserved. He returned to his boarding house, ate dinner, and paid his landlady $20 that he owed her. Kelly transferred the rest of the money into a suitcase and then went to the train depot. The body of Joseph Stickney lay undiscovered for over two hours. When police realized what had happened, Joseph Kelly was considered a suspect, but they believed that he had accomplices. They also believed that he had returned to his home state of Massachusetts. Two men were arrested in Waltham, Massachusetts, and held in connection with the Summersworth robbery until both proved to have alibis. Joseph Kelly had grown up in the town of Amsbury, Massachusetts in a family of ten children, all described as bright and smart. His family told reporters that young Joe was a quite orderly boy who was barely ten years old when he began to turn wild. He'd been involved in some petty thefts, such as bicycle stealing, and served about seven months in the Concord Reformatory for breaking and entering. But those in Amesbury who knew him were surprised at the charge of murder and believed that if he was involved in the robbery, it was as an accessory and not a principal. Kelly had not gone to Massachusetts. He had taken a Boston and Maine train as far as Union, Maine. Then he took the next train for Cookshire Junction, Quebec, where he boarded the Halifax Express and bought a ticket for Montreal. When the Summersworth police realized that Kelly had traveled north, they traced his movement to the town of St. Austin de Newton, Quebec. There he had paid a hotel keeper $10 in gold for a woman's dress and left the hotel wearing the dress, saying that he wanted to surprise his wife who lived in Montreal. Kelly was found in a Montreal brothel, sitting between two prostitutes and still wearing the dress. If the disguise was meant to fool the police, it had not worked. Kelly was arrested by the Montreal police and extradited back to Summersworth, New Hampshire, to stand trial. Joseph E. Kelly was tried November 8, 1897, in Dover, New Hampshire, and on the first day of the trial, the jury was taken by train to Summersworth to see the murder site and Kelly's room across the street. Kelly smiled through the proceedings both in Summersworth and Dover and seemed to enjoy the attention he was getting. Back in the Dover courtroom, the prosecution presented witnesses who had seen Kelly the day of the murder or who had seen a man with a mustache carrying a pillowcase. Railroad employees who had spoken to Kelly that day testified as did the Quebec hotel keeper who sold him the dress. The cross-examinations of the Summersworth witnesses by the defense indicated that they might be seeking an insanity plea. Kelly was described as boyish, He wrote poetry and had tried several unusual money-making schemes, such as selling artificial bouquets on the street and using a megaphone from the roof of a hotel to advertise businesses. On the fourth day of the trial, it became official. When court opened that morning, Kelly stood up and said he was ready to plead guilty if his hanging could be scheduled for January 16, 1898. The reason for that particular date was that Kelly had a contract with the devil that would expire January 15th. The guilty plea was accepted, the jury was dismissed, and the remainder of the trial would consist of arguments relating to the degree of the crime. 
Tim Kelly's family and others from Amesbury were no longer speaking of Joe as bright and smart, but said that his Amesbury nickname had been Foolish Joe. At age four, Joe had fallen and a rusty nail had pierced his skull. He was unconscious for three days. Following that, he had suffered from fits and convulsions as a child and sleepwalking as an adult. Kelly was examined by several mental health experts who all agreed that he suffered from arrested development. Dr. Charles Bancroft of the New Hampshire State Asylum for the Insane concluded from Kelly's history and from the eight examinations he made that Kelly was incurable, saying, he's a child, I should place him about eight or nine years old mentally and morally. He has the impulses and instincts of a man, but the judgment and capacity of a child of nine. Dr. Thomas Waterman, examining physician for the city of Boston, concurred, saying, a high-grade imbecile expresses Kelly's condition. He is far from being an idiot. A high-grade imbecile has all the impulses of a man but the judgment of a child. Several other medical experts agreed with their colleagues and all asserted that Kelly was incurable and would not benefit by being sent to an asylum. When Kelly realized the import of his plea, it was a great blow to his pride. He was especially hurt when poems he had written were read in court to illustrate his mental deficiencies. The Boston Daily Globe described Kelly's reaction, but when he found out that his lawyers were deriding his poetry, making fun of his lectures and holding him up as a maniac, he wept in poignant grief, the first emotion he has shown since he's been charged with the crime. To have his lyrics termed doggerel and to be called a high-grade imbecile was too much for the prisoner's pride, and he burst into violent weeping and covered his face with his handkerchief. The judges ruled Kelly insane, found him guilty of second-degree murder, and sentenced him to 30 years in the state prison in Concord. When asked what would happen after his sentence expired, the medical men agreed that Kelly was unlikely to live that long. Kelly was indifferent to this sentence and almost seemed disappointed that he would not hang, telling reporters, "'Well, I expected something different. I thought I was going to be hanged. My lawyers are satisfied, though, so I suppose it's all right." In Summersworth, people were extremely dissatisfied with the outcome of the trial. Most felt that Kelly deserved to hang for his crime. A secret meeting was held among 20 men of Summersworth, New Hampshire and Berwick, Maine to assess the situation. They formulated a plan to kidnap Kelly while still in the Dover jail and to take him out and lynch him but they lacked the leadership necessary to execute the plan. Joseph Kelly was taken quietly to Concord to begin his sentence. Up next on Weird Darkness, do the ghosts of doomed lovers haunt a jagged cliff in Hot Springs, North Carolina? We'll take a look at Bangart Fort, one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of India. And people in the southwest of the United States are reporting sightings of giant birds, monstrous bat-like creatures, even winged humanoids. What are they seeing? These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. While you're listening, Be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Do the ghosts of doomed lovers haunt a jagged cliff in Hot Springs, North Carolina? Local legend says yes. The tragic tale goes something like this. Long ago, 
a beautiful Cherokee woman named Mist on the Mountain eloped with Magua, a handsome member of a visiting tribe. However, the happy union didn't last long. A jealous suitor named Tall Pine murdered Magua in a fit of rage. Devastated, Mist on the Mountain fled from the scene and hurled herself over a steep cliff overlooking the French Broad River. Now, they say, the doomed lovers haunt the ledge and river below. An excerpt from the 1906 book Hot Springs, Past and Present describes one group's eerie encounter at the spot now known as Lover's Leap. Let the unwary traveler beware when the June moon rises and the flooded river laps at the base of the rock. Three friendly moonshiners once made a rendezvous at the rock on such a night, June 7, 1875. They were taking a little more than their accustomed stimulant as they waited, when suddenly, as the full moon began to rise, the events of that other night so long ago were enacted before their astonished eyes. Again they witnessed the death of Magua, the wild flight and tragic leap of mist on the mountain. In panic they fled, each man for himself, leaving their jugs behind them, never again to rendezvous in that particular spot. Lover's Leap is along the Appalachian Trail, and thousands of hikers have trekked past the fateful cliff. Earlier this month, my husband and I paid a visit, though heat and killer switchbacks were the only thing that troubled us. Do Mist on the Mountain and Magua lurk at Lover's Leap? Though contemporary accounts are rare, the haunting legend lives on. As the author of Hot Springs Past and Present notes, who can say that the unseen spirits of those lovers do not still haunt that grim rock, the sight of their love and death, watching with jealous eyes the careless crowds that come and go? A curious type of cryptid that has managed to remain pervasive all around the world is that of the flying monster or winged humanoid. Such reports come in from all over the world and often feature strange creatures that are remarkably similar in appearance. Why this may be is beyond the scope of my knowledge, but there are numerous bird or bat-like beasts that seem to lurk in the dark corners of our planet. One good example of an avian mystery is a massive, seemingly humanoid beast that has long been sighted in the southwest United States and has managed to elude understanding. Sprawled out over 4,872 square miles along the northern Rio Grande River in the southernmost tip of South Texas lies the Rio Grande Valley, once known as El Magico Valle del Rio Grande or the Magical Valley of the Rio Grande, by the people of the region. The Rio Grande Valley is at once one of the fastest-growing regions of the United States and also home to majestic, vast expanses of untamed, unspoiled wilderness encompassing numerous wildlife refuges and national parks including the Laguna Atacosta National Wildlife Refuge, Santa Ana National Wildlife Refuge, and Benson Rio Grande Valley State Park, which draw in droves of tourists and outdoorsmen every year. It is here, in this rugged region, that a very strange avian flying creature has been sighted since at least the 1970s. What has come to be known as the Big Bird, or sometimes the Birdman, the beast is usually described as being a massive, vaguely humanoid bird of some type with a face reminiscent of a gorilla, a six-inch long beak, a bald head, and blood-red eyes that are sometimes reported as glowing. In the 1970s, there was a spate of sightings of this creature which started, or was at least thrust into the public consciousness, on January 1, 1976, when an 11-year-old Tracy Lawson was out playing in the backyard of her home near Harlingen, Texas along with their 14-year-old cousin, Jackie Davies. At some point, they noticed something very bizarre lurking around 100 yards away near an irrigation canal, 
which upon observation with binoculars was described as being a horrible-looking giant bird around five feet in height, with a face like a gorilla, a bald head, and enormous, luminous red eyes. The strange beast glared at them for a time, and then reportedly let out an unearthly shriek before disappearing from view behind some trees. At first, the girl's parents did not believe them, but the next day, Jackie's stepfather, Tom Walden, would find unusual three-toed tracks measuring eight inches across in the area where the creature had been seen. Also strange was the Lawson family dog, which was usually friendly and rambunctious, but he began to act very strangely, cowering in his doghouse and refusing to go outside. The next sighting happened a week later in San Benito, when in the early morning of January 7th, two police officers named Arturo Padilla and Homer Galvin saw what they described as a massive bird-like creature around five feet tall with a gorilla-like face, a 12 to 15 foot wingspan, and glowing red eyes. Later that very same day, witness Alvariso Guajardo spotted the creature near his home in Brownsville. He described it as having somewhat bat-like wings, eyes as big as silver dollars, and possessing a long, thin beak through which it issued a loud, unearthly groan. Wajardo would tell the Brownsville Herald, I was scared. It's got wings like a bird, but it's not a bird. That animal is not of this world. There were other sightings, which I have covered in Weird Darkness with the Bat Squatch episode, but I will go over here again. For instance, there was the case of brothers David and John Daunt, who were driving along a rural road in the Rio Grande Valley when a bat-winged humanoid with a head reminiscent of a wolf and estimated as being 8 to 10 feet tall landed in front of them, forcing them to screech to a halt. As they tried to back away from the nightmarish creature, it loped forward as if about to attack, only to alight into the air and fly over them with an audible whooshing of its wings. In another case, a father and son claimed to have been out hunting deer in Hidalgo County near Houston when the creature had swooped down to grab the father and try to carry him off, with the man only barely managing to escape when the son shot at it with his rifle. The man was apparently left deeply shaken and with broken ribs and nasty talon marks on his body. Attacks like this seemed to have been par for the course with some of these reports. Things took a turn for the truly frightening with a report from January 15th from a man named Armando Grimaldo. The witness claimed that he had been out having a cigarette at his home in Raymondville when he heard a flapping sound and something that sounded vaguely like a strange whistle. When he looked up, he said that an immense bird-like creature with a simian face and leathery skin had clawed at him with its talons, ripping apart his shirt and jacket in the process, and indeed he was found with shredded clothes and in a state of shock by neighbors who had heard his desperate screams for help. That very same week, another man named Francisco Maginales reported that he had been attacked by a giant birdman at Eagle Pass, and doctors confirmed that he had sustained deep scratches by some sort of wild animal. When the scarier reports hit the papers, it caused a bit of a hysteria, with some people refusing to leave their homes after dark for fear of being attacked by the beast. There were even claims that pets were disappearing and that there were cattle mutilations in the region at the time, further painting a sinister veneer over it all. Three days later, on January 18th, there were two separate sightings of the creature one by two sisters in Brownsville and another by two soldiers near Poteet. Indeed, sightings of the big bird began to come in on an almost daily basis over the next few weeks, from people of all ages and all walks of life, and the creature started to appear all over the news. One notable sighting was made on February 24, 1976, when three teachers saw the creature near Harlingen this time with the interesting detail that they thought it looked similar to a prehistoric flying reptile, the Pteranodon. Sometimes the big bird 
was seen multiple times by the same witness, such as is the case with Alex Resendez, who claimed to have seen it three times and said it had short legs, glassy, black eyes, striped wings, and a translucent beak. He would say of it, you have to look close because his beak is very transparent. If you see it real fast, you're going to think he ain't got no beak. I never seen a bird that big. He was brownish like dirt. He does not have long legs and does not stand like other birds. Big Bird Mania got so heated that there were large rewards offered to capture or kill the creature, which drew in hunters looking to cash in. These reckless, money-hungry hunters went out traipsing around the wilderness looking for any big birds to shoot, which made quite a few wildlife conservationists nervous as they believed that the big bird could be a large endangered species of a bird. During this time, there were a few false alarms, such as a mass sighting of the big bird just south of Alamo, which was filmed and later identified as a blue heron, which is what quite a few skeptics thought people were actually seeing. Although the sightings eventually died down, they never really did stop altogether, and the monster has been spotted throughout the 70s, 80s, and beyond. One rather terrifying encounter occurred in 1977 when a local woman at Santa Rosa spotted a gigantic bird with black eyes and a face like an old woman in a tree. The creature then flew straight at her, and when she retreated into her home, it continued to scratch at the door for some time before being chased away by some neighborhood dogs. The dogs purportedly chased it out of sight, but the next day, when the animals did not return, searchers found their mangled bodies, torn apart and mutilated by some immensely powerful animal. Since then, the creature has been sporadically reported all the way up to today and has become a persistent local legend in the area, sort of like Nessie at Loch Ness. It is not just the U.S. side of the Rio Grande that has seen sightings of this bizarre creature. In one sighting, a man was driving along a remote dirt road near the town of El Tigre, Chihuahua in Mexico and was startled when a giant bird passed right over his vehicle after which it continued to make relentless passes at him. On one of these passes, it allegedly smashed into the windshield and fell to the road, and the witness ran it over. When he looked into his rearview mirror, he reportedly saw it got back up, as if nothing had happened, and flew off into the night. Interestingly enough, the Rio Grande region of the south of the border long had legends and sightings of a creature that seems very similar to what has been seen in Texas. Locals of northern Mexico and the Rio Grande of Texas have long spoken of a giant bird creature which they called La Lechuza that can supposedly stand up to 7 feet high and have a wingspan of 15 feet or more. Often described as looking like an oversized owl or raven, La Lechuza can be black or white and it's often said to have a face like that of an old woman. The creature is most often seen as being a part of local folklore, where it is depicted as a vengeful supernatural spirit that feeds off of negative emotions and kidnaps children to eat. But there have been actual sightings of these things in the area for centuries. Could this have anything to do with the big bird sightings? Besides magical Mexican spirits, there has been much speculation as to what the creature could be, with most skeptics saying it's nothing more than some large species of bird like a stork or heron, and there have been cases of exotic out-of-place specimens of a type in Central America, a stork called the Jabiru in the Rio Grande region. The Jabiru is certainly imposing enough to be mistaken for the beast, which can stand 5 feet tall and have a wingspan of around 10 feet and interestingly also has a featherless head, which fits into the reports of Big Bird having a bald head. It also looks suitably eerie enough to perhaps generate reports of something strange for those who have never seen one before. However, it is hard to see how any stork or heron could possibly be mistaken for having an ape-like face, vicious talons, or glowing red eyes, 
and reports mentioning short legs on the mystery monster do not match either. Storks and herons don't typically attack humans either, so what else could it be? More mysterious explanations have mentioned that it could be some new species, aliens, interdimensional beings, or even the infamous enigmatic Mothman. Then there's the possibility that this is all just an urban legend based on hoaxes and lies. But that would be strange, considering the wealth of reliable witnesses who have claimed to have seen it, including two police officers. So, what are we dealing with here? These creatures have been spotted all over the Rio Grande by witnesses of all ages and all walks of life. Are they all just making things up or misidentifying normal birds? Or is this something weirder? Are these visitors from some other plane of existence, perhaps trickster spirits having some fun at our expense? Whatever the case may be, the Birdman, or Big Bird of the Rio Grande, has continued to be featured heavily in the cryptozoological and paranormal lore of the area, and looks likely to remain that way for some time to come. Bangar Fort is known as the most haunted place in India and perhaps the greatest unsolved mystery. There was no doubting the fact that anything associated with the supernatural attracts a huge amount of attention and the deserted city of Bangar cashes in on that very idea. The many haunted stories of Bangar Fort have transformed it into a bucket list destination of sorts. Curious travelers come in order to experience cheap thrills, and while some go back disappointed, others simply cannot have enough of the suspense associated with the story of the Bangar Fort. If you happen to be one of those inquisitive travelers, it is imperative for you to visit this place and find out for yourself. Most people are of the belief that Bangar Fort is haunted and there is no dearth of tales that help in amplifying the mystery that is Bangar. Venturing into the fort after sunset is nothing short of an act of bravery, as it is supposed to be a center for paranormal activity and the Archaeological Survey of India therefore has prohibited people from visiting the Bangar fort at night. Of the many Bangar stories that the locals like to indulge in, the most popular is that of Emperor Mado Singh who built the city after attaining the approval of Guru Balu Nath, an ascetic who used to meditate there. The saint gave his approval on the condition that the shadow of the emperor's palace should never fall on his retreat. If in case it did, the city would crumble into ruins. Once the construction was completed, the retreat of Guru Balu was unfortunately shadowed by the palace. Having incurred the saint's wrath, Bangar immediately transformed into a cursed city and could never be rebuilt as no structures ever managed to survive in it. It's interesting to note that the tomb of Guru Balu Nath can still be found among the ruins. Another Bangar fort story pertains to Princess Ratnavati. According to legends, her beauty was nonpareil and stories of her surpassing physical attractiveness even transcended kingdoms and borders. When she turned 18, suitors from several states asked for her hand in marriage. Of all these suitors was a sorcerer named Sing Jai, who was aware of the fact that he was no match for the princess. However, he decided to entice her with the magical powers he possessed. He was lucky enough to see Princess Ratnavati's mistress in the market and enchanted the oil she was purchasing with black magic. He was of the hope that the princess would surrender herself to him upon touching the oil. However, his attempt was futile, as Ratnavati witnessed his trick and poured the oil on the ground, which then morphed into a rock, rolled toward the magician, and crushed him. Before dying, Sanjaya cursed the city of Bangar to death and as a result it never witnessed any rebirths. 
Moreover, in the battle between Ashabgar and Bangar, Princess Ratnavati was killed, thus adding more weight to his malediction. Hopes, however, never die, as several locals are of the belief that she has returned in a different form and will ultimately come back to end the unfortunate spell on Bangar. While the Bangar Fort story has been rubbished by scientists, nothing stops the villagers from believing that it is a sanctuary for ghosts. People have supposedly heard voices that are unaccounted for. The locals claim to have heard women screaming and crying, bangles breaking and strange music emerging from the fort. There have been instances where a special perfume was emanating from the Bangar Fort, along with ghostly shadows and inexplicable lights. Some people have felt the strange sensation of being followed and even slapped by an invisible entity. It is believed that if a person enters the fort after sunset, he or she will never ever come out of it. The doors are therefore always locked after dusk, and entry into the Bangar Fort at night is absolutely forbidden. Are all of the Bangar Fort stories factual or just strange pieces of fiction? Is the Bangar Fort really haunted? Nobody can say. Except maybe ghost hunters. When Weird Darkness Returns Did a Nikola Tesla experiment cause the Tunguska blast? A lifelong medium comes across a smiling entity. And the U.S. State Department has evacuated even more Americans due to a sickness that is spreading when people hear strange sounds. What could be causing the noise? These stories are up next. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. It was a medical mystery that began in 2016, involving U.S. Embassy employees and a number of other Americans stationed in Havana, Cuba, that began falling ill. Now, half a world away in China, the U.S. State Department says they have evacuated two more employees who appear to have been stricken with symptoms remarkably similar to those that surfaced in Cuba more than a year ago. While theories exist as to the cause of the mysterious sickness, it remains undetermined what precisely the true cause may be. The latest spate of illnesses was reported earlier this week when two adult employees at the American consulate in Guangzhou, South China, were evacuated after displaying neurological symptoms, the New York Times reported. Symptoms of the odd ailment that began to affect U.S. employees in Havana, Cuba in 2016 include hearing loss, nausea, disorientation, and a host of other conditions. All of those affected report one thing in common, that they heard strange sounds prior to exhibiting symptoms of the mysterious illness. Concern over the cause of the strange illness led to accusations against Cuban authorities 
with the allegation that they might have employed monitoring equipment covertly, which had an adverse effect on those nearby. However, with reports of the strange sound sickness now stemming from the U.S. consulate in southern China, U.S. officials are reportedly concerned that another foreign power, possibly Russia, may be involved. Following the initial round of incidents, the State Department warned its employees about any unusual acute auditory or sensory phenomena accompanied by unusual sounds or piercing noises, and further directed those who experienced the phenomena do not attempt to locate their source. While the cause of the noises and the neurological symptoms reported in conjunction with them remain unknown, even former U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson referred to the incidents as attacks. Tillerson's successor, Mike Pompeo, has issued similar language in relation to the incidents, noting the similarity to the 2016-2017 Cuban incidents and those which began to occur in China back in April. A study, which looked into the cause of the alleged attacks that occurred in Havana, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, found persistent cognitive vestibular and oculomotor dysfunction, as well as sleep impairment and headaches, were observed among U.S. government personnel in Havana, Cuba, associated with reports of directional audible and or sensory phenomena of unclear origin. The report also noted in its conclusion that these individuals appeared to have sustained injury to widespread brain networks without an associated history of head trauma. The study was carried out at University of Pennsylvania Medical School's Center for Brain Injury and Repair earlier this year. Washington Post reported on skepticism that now surrounds the aforementioned study, noting that doctors detected no clear physical origin in the brain. 18 of the 21 patients showed nothing unusual on a brain scan, and the other three had mild or moderate damage to white matter what the investigators acknowledged could be due to pre-existing disease processes. Perhaps one of the most searing criticisms of the Pennsylvania study was issued by Robert McIntosh, Ph.D., and Sergio Della Sala, M.D., of the University of Edinburgh, who wrote in The Psychologist that we should be more worried about reputational damage to neuropsychology and psychology in general than about any sinister new sonic weapons. In a statement issued by University of Pennsylvania's medical school, they noted they are continuing to work with the Department of State to evaluate and treat personnel who have reported audible phenomena experiences, further noting they are not able to provide specifics about different patient groups at this time. To date, everything from the insinuation of mysterious sonic weapons to Jamaica field crickets – seriously – have been suggested as possible sources for the strange, sickening noises. However, with the new reports of Americans who fell ill under remarkably similar circumstances in Guangzhou, China, could we end up seeing the results of the Penn State report being vindicated after all? I've been a medium since I can remember, and my first encounter was when I was about six years old. I had a nightmare, so I was going into my parents' room. When I reached the hallway, I saw a woman with long, dark hair and a flowing white dress. She was staring into my parents' bedroom. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I rubbed my eyes, and when I looked at her again, she turned and smiled at me the way a loving mother would smile at a child. I didn't know what to do. I charged down the hall, waving my hands in front of me, and just before I would have touched her, she vanished. I woke up my mom, who told me it was a dream, and to go to sleep. The next morning, knowing full well that it was not a dream, as my mom had said, I went to investigate the spot where the woman was standing. In that spot, I found a single, small white feather. When I was little, and being a medium, I thought she was a ghost. Now I believe I saw a guardian angel, as it was a few weeks later that my parents got into a car accident on the interstate 
where they were hit head on. She knew I needed my parents, and it wasn't their time to go. She was protecting them. After finding that feather, I will always be a believer. After all, seeing is believing. On June 30, 1908, a giant explosion flattened over 800 square miles of forest near the Tunguska River in Siberian Russia. The area of the blast was extremely remote, but the devastation was immense. An estimated 80 million trees were flattened and whole herds of deer wiped out. The magnitude of the blast was thousands of times greater than the nuclear bomb dropped on Hiroshima and its impact was felt as far afield as Great Britain. Had it occurred just minutes later, it would have destroyed the whole of St. Petersburg and killed millions of people. Whilst it quickly became apparent something momentous had happened at Tanguska, the area of the blast remained inaccessible until the first expedition there in 1927. The 1927 investigation began nearly a century of debate about what caused the blast with explanations ranging from comets and meteors to expulsions of natural gas and even many black holes. One of the alternative theories about Tunguska revolves around pioneering inventor Nikola Tesla. Tesla was a scientific genius credited with several important innovations in electricity, magnetism, and radio. For many years, he explored ideas for the wireless transmission of electricity. In 1901, he began construction of the 57-meter-high Wardenclyffe Tower in New York. Ostensibly for telegraphy, he used the tower to further his experiments into the transmission of electricity. But by 1906, his chief financial backer, J.P. Morgan, grew dissatisfied with Tesla's experiments and withdrew funding. Tesla's plans were in ruin. He became desperate and, according to biographers, suffered a nervous breakdown. It has been suggested that Tesla tried to salvage his work at Wardenclyffe and revive his fortunes by staging an audacious publicity stunt. Tesla had become convinced his wireless electricity transmitter could be used as a weapon, able to transmit an electrical wave through the Earth of such intensity it could destroy a target hundreds of miles away. Like the rest of America, Tesla was gripped by the exploits of Admiral Robert Peary and his assault on the North Pole. At the time of the Tunguska blast in 1908, Peary was camped out at Ellesmere Island in preparation for his bid to reach the Pole. Tesla had made cryptic remarks about contacting Paris somehow and had instructed him to watch the tundra for signals. What better way for Tesla to demonstrate the awesome power of his device to the world than to fire a bolt of energy towards Ellesmere and rip up some ice or cause a light show. Advocates of the theory that Tesla was behind the Tunguska blast claim his publicity stunt went drastically wrong, his concentrated waves of electricity overshooting its target, instead causing the explosion at Tunguska. Could Tesla really have been responsible for the Tunguska blast? The idea of death rays was very prevalent around the time of Tunguska. Several inventors, notably Harry Grendel Matthews in England, claimed to have invented such a weapon. In 1907, there was much speculation in the press that the explosion that destroyed French battleship Aina in March was caused by some kind of wireless energy wave, with Tesla's name even mentioned in connection with the disaster. Tesla himself gave rise to much of the speculation by repeatedly claiming his electricity transmission device could be used as a directed energy weapon. Writing to Liberty Magazine, he explained, "...my invention requires a large plant, but once it's established, it would be possible to destroy anything, men or machines, approaching within a radius of 200 miles." Tesla wrote several letters to the New York Times in which he expanded on the potential of his invention as a death ray. 
As to projecting wave energy to any particular region of the globe, this can be done by my devices. The spot at which the desired effect is to be produced can be calculated very closely, assuming the accepted terrestrial measurements to be correct. Just two months before Tunguska, he wrote tellingly, "...this is not a dream. Even now, wireless power plants could be constructed by which any region of the globe might be rendered uninhabitable without subjecting the population of other parts to serious danger or inconveniences." Did Tesla, beset by financial problems and desperate for his Wardenclyffe plant to succeed, use it for precisely the purpose he described to the New York Times? Although the prevailing consensus as to the cause of the Tunguska blast is the explosion of a comet or meteorite in the atmosphere above the area, there are numerous reasons to doubt this. Several eyewitnesses report describing unusual and prolonged lights in the sky, both before and for days after the impact, quite unlike those to be expected from a meteorite or comet. Even as far afield as England, the sky was lit up for days afterwards. Widespread reports of night turning into day flooded into the newspapers. One correspondent recounted how he was able to read a book illuminated purely by the night sky. Tesla specifically cited the ability of Wardenclyffe to light up the atmosphere on several occasions. I have planned many details of a plant which would be amply sufficient to illuminate the entire ocean so that such a disaster as that of the Titanic would not be repeated. Many of the eyewitnesses also describe Earth shaking even before the explosion. Again, Tesla described how his device could shake the ground, even boasting on one occasion that he could shake the Empire State Building to its foundations. The meteorite theory is also undermined by the fact that no blast crater or trace of any meteorite had ever been found, despite exhaustive searches. If, however, Tesla really could transmit a directed energy beam through the ground, it would leave no traces or crater. It has been pointed out that a line drawn between Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower and Tunguska passes through the location of the supposed target of his energy beam, Ellesmere Island. Whilst the correlation isn't exact, it is an interesting coincidence. Did Tesla, intending to shake up the ice at Ellesmere, overshoot his target and accidentally cause the devastation at Tunguska? The concept that electricity could be wirelessly transmitted over long distance is now discounted as pseudoscience by most scientists. Whereas Tesla did successfully demonstrate short-range transmission of electricity, he was never able to demonstrate any ability to transmit it over great distances. Tesla, always desperate for an audience for his inventions, would have widely advertised the technology if he had really perfected it, as he claimed. Tesla was a very eccentric individual. He had visions, claimed to receive signals from extraterrestrials, and somewhat oddly was in love with a pigeon. He was also an inveterate self-publicist, notorious for making far-fetched and exaggerated claims which he could not back up. For example, he once claimed he could fire an energy beam at the moon and disturb its surface. There have been many attempts to produce the kind of death ray proposed by Tesla over the years, but no such weapon has ever been produced, despite its obvious military application. The vast amount of energy Tesla's death ray would require to operate as he boasted would appear to rule it out as any kind of viable device. It is estimated that to produce the estimated 10 megaton blast recorded at Tunguska, Wardenclyffe would need to transmit billions of watts worth of power, thousands of times more than the New York power grid he relied on was capable of producing. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. 
WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.